These containers sitting at a port in Manila almost triggered a war. They were full of garbage, including used adult diapers, and the Philippines refused to let them into the country. President Rodrigo Duterte just told Trudeau that he has one week or it's war. After rotting in the sun for nearly six years, Canada finally took its waste back and burnt it. It made headlines everywhere and revealed the dark underbelly of the global plastic waste network. It's rife with corruption, run by private traders and fly-by-night establishments, and Interpol found that it could be worse. We often find the same names linked to other crimes. Money laundering, tax evasion, fraud. It's all the same criminals. And the currency driving it all is plastic scrap. I want to find out more about what's going on. But everybody I'm speaking to seems to be answering in code. So how do things work behind the scenes? Oh, you know what? <laughs> like that. So how does the global plastic waste trade even work? And how can we get out of this mess? The most amazing food wrap ever developed. Saran wrap. That's right. Plastic was the miracle material of the 1950s in the global north. But when waste started growing in dumps around cities, its manufacturers had to do something to protect their image. They came up with an idea. Recycling. And they really pushed the message with ads like this. People start pollution. People can stop it. And concerts like this. Catchy, but records show that even then, industry insiders never really believed recycling would solve the waste problem. It's all about money. Historically, virgin plastic has been cheaper and better quality than recycled plastic. And the industry's predictions were right. Of all the plastic ever produced, less than 9% has been recycled. But for a short moment in time, because of a series of unlikely global events, this utopia that they had dreamt up actually kind of worked. Enter China. By the 90s, China was becoming the world's manufacturer. Every day, shipping containers carrying all sorts of products would journey to the US and Europe. But when they returned empty, they became a serious financial opportunity. The West consumed, collected its waste and shipped it out of sight to China. China recycled what it could and sent back new products for more consumption. And this cycle was on repeat. And it was dirt cheap. For example, one US trader told me that even in 2010, while it cost around $85 to dispose of a ton of waste domestically, it cost only $35 to ship a ton of it to China. Could there be a sweeter deal, really? But here's where it all got really murky. You can't just recycle any plastic. They come in grades that you can tell by looking at the bottom of the container. And each grade needs to be recycled on its own in a specific recycling plant. It only makes sense to recycle high-grade plastic, like a shampoo bottle or a detergent container, because what comes out on the other side still has value. But things like styrofoam that food comes in can never be recycled, which means they'll only ever be used once. What's more is that each shipment of plastic has to be free of contaminants, which could be anything from food waste to just a different grade of plastic in the mix. So when low-grade or contaminated plastic was sent to China, either cheap labour was needed to sort it, or it had to be dumped and burnt. Within a few years, several Chinese towns near landfills and incineration sites started complaining of polluted air and water. Cancer rates rose. So by 2018, China had had enough. It effectively banned all plastic waste imports and the world had lost its number one recycler. But China was prepared. Their recycling industry was established and the country was now producing enough waste domestically to supply its own raw materials for recycling. So post-ban, the rest of the world was scrambling. Some waste was burnt within the countries but shipments of garbage still needed to find new destinations. And they found them soon enough in countries close to China, like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, etc. Heng Chun is a campaigner with Greenpeace in Malaysia, the country that became the leading importer at the time. 
Greenpeace, along with citizens and governments of some Southeast Asian countries, are now demanding that the West stop using them as the waste dumps of the world. The big uh, country, uh, especially the rich, richer country, they produce lots of waste and then they put it to the global south. And then the pro they're shipping the problem to global south. Malaysia is still a develop developing country. To get seen as other Southeast Asian country, uh, mostly the developing country, the enforcement are, are not that straight. So which means that uh, this might also give opportunity for some illegal uh, businesses to import all these plastic waste. So let's get into the nitty gritty. First, the legal stuff. Broadly, the high value plastic we saw earlier can be legally traded if it's segregated and uncontaminated. It can have a second life, either in incineration or what's called energy recovery, which is controversial because it creates high emissions, or it can enter the recycling market, which is growing around the world. But processing plastic before it can be sold on the market can be expensive especially in developed countries, because regulations are stricter and wages are higher. All things considered, it might be cheaper to just send the container away to someone who can get the job done cheap. Okay, this is, you know, let's say a container full of plastic. Yuhani Grossman looks into corruption in environmental-related businesses around the world. The government is going to pay, I don't know what, $5,000, I'm just making the figure up, to recycle it. And then the company says, okay, we're not actually going to recycle it. So we're going to keep $1,000. And then we're going to spend $500 to send the container. And we're going to pay somebody $1,000 in Indonesia to make it disappear. And then we still have $2,500 profit. It's something like that. And companies in Asian countries are willing to take the plastic in. Local waste collection is much less developed here. And so clean plastic can be used to feed the upcoming recycling industries. But here's where laws can be broken. The Basel Convention is the international treaty that stipulates which plastics can and can't be traded. It says, for example, that contaminated or low-grade plastics need special permission from the receiving country's governments before they can be shipped. But independent investigators found that plastic traders have discovered ways to bypass this. First, waste shipments can be mislabeled and pass through customs checks in the West. And then companies in developing countries who offer to take in low-grade or unsorted plastic find ways to smuggle it past the local authorities. Even if checks take place, they can be evaded. And so the most obvious way in which corruption comes into play is to bribe officials uh, to allow you to import that waste. Once allowed into the country, traders need to find a way to make money from the bad plastic. Investigators found unsuitable disposal, including into rivers, landfills and plantations, along with cheap labour to be the main modus operandi. So basically the same things that happened in China. But there's even more criminal energy in this. The criminals are relying on money laundering techniques and this typically would take the form of a legal waste company that would engage in both legal and illegal trades and then mix the payments across these two business lines. Ilsa Hart's foundation has investigated the role of money laundering and tax fraud across the waste trade industry. For environmental crimes, this is a particularly effective strategy because it can be very difficult for authorities in the private sector to distinguish between legal and illegal trades. A combination of these factors is what happened in the Philippines-Canada case. Private traders were involved on both sides, the waste was misdeclared and got caught at customs. Proceeds from the illegal waste trade could be up to $12 billion annually, which puts it on par with migrant trafficking. So this, this really is a, a big issue. Um, but it goes beyond the financial costs. And we also see that waste trafficking fuels poverty, has massive pollution impacts for, for the environment, and also fuels corruption. Um, and for waste trafficking, many of the profits remained in the exporting countries, with importing countries only generating part of the profits from resale or reuse of certain waste. From 2021, the Basel Convention toughened regulations. More types of plastic were banned. But environmentalists say this still doesn't go far enough. If we leave the door slightly open, someone will go through it. Pierre Condomine's group fights for environmental justice. 
In November 2021, it lobbied the German government to halt waste exports to Vietnam. On average, a person in Germany generates up to 2 kilograms of trash per day. So can the European Union deal with its own waste output? To me, that's not the right question. The EU is supposed to have the best waste management infrastructure in the world. And we know it is shipping to countries where the waste management infrastructure is not so developed. If we don't have it, the countries to which we ship, they definitely do not have it. His group says Western countries have to develop their own recycling systems, like China did. Now, everybody is sitting up and noticing that, no, let's do it ourselves, and there is money to be made. Sunil Bagaria is a plastic trader based in New Jersey. He used to ship to China, but has set up a recycling plant in the US where he sees a huge market. Now, with all this consumer backlash because of our insistence on using plastics. So the, those things are now making the CPG companies, you know, consumer product companies, brand names, you know, they are having a big, they are like, oh my God, because they cannot survive without plastic. Everybody needs to use plastic. They will have to come to companies like ours or 10 other companies to get their needs of recycled plastic. The demand for some high-grade recycled plastic has been soaring lately, even beating virgin plastic out of the competition in some cases. As more Asian countries clamp down or ban imports, the big question is, where will all the plastic go in the future? It does look like countries that are not part of the Basel Convention, like Poland or Turkey, have become the latest destinations. So what can be done? First, wider-reaching policies and stricter enforcement. And Western countries have to invest in their own recycling industries to clean up their own mess. But to treat all that waste domestically, the thing that needs to be cut down at source is the amount of plastic we produce, consume and throw away in the West. Have you thought before about where your trash ends up? And did you know it's fueling so many fires around the globe? Let us know your thoughts in the comments and come back every week for more.